Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this session. I am delighted to be able to uh, present to you uh, Professor Hashim Ahmed, who's very kindly agreed to deliver the JCU guest lecture for 2020. As you all know, Hash is a renowned expert throughout the world in prostate cancer diagnosis and management. He is Professor and Chair of Urology at Imperial College London, where he also chairs their clinical trials unit. He is the chair of the NCRI Prostate Research Group, and he's going to spend the next 25 to 30 minutes giving you his take on the future of urological ma cancer management for the next two decades. Hashim, thank you very much. Thank you for asking me to give the Journal of Clinical Urology guest lecture. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ian Pierce and the BAS organizing committee of BAS 2020 virtual meeting, uh, and especially Asif Munir. Uh, it's a real honor and privilege to give this talk on the future of urological cancer management over the next two decades. I have a wonderful team behind me and I'd like to thank them and my funders uh, who keep me supported uh, in my research and clinical activities. This is going to be really a whistle stop tour of what I think is, are going to be the key innovations over the next 10 to 20 years that will come into clinical practice. Inevitably, I will be wrong on some of them and inevitably some of these innovations will take much longer than we think. And I'm going to wrap up my talk uh, to look at innovations in how we do research within re surgery so that we can bring these innovations into clinical practice much quicker. Let me start off with screening and early diagnosis. I think we're going to see the biggest leaps in this uh, and coupled with artificial intelligence, I think we're going to see significant changes in how we deliver medicine over the next two decades. Firstly, can we institute screening for urological cancers. I think we've all uh, rehearsed the arguments for and against in prostate cancer, but there are arguments for screening uh, renal cancer or for bladder cancer, for instance. And I think those arguments will get stronger. In prostate, we are looking at whether a short MRI instead of PSA or in combination with PSA rather than fluidic biomarkers, which there has been an unhealthy obsession with, I think, over the last two decades, but whether imaging can really transform how we screen in the community. And a short MRI may find cancers that PSA in of itself misses. And the first prostogram study showed that if you set the threshold for a positive test at MRI level, at score four and five, then you don't increase the rate of biopsy but you do increase the numbers of significant cancers you find compared to PSA alone without increasing the number of insignificant cancers. So this may be a way forward and we need to do this study now in five to 10,000 men in the community. And that will hopefully start within the next year to two years. We're going to see a significant growth in prostate cancer cases anyway. And so even without screening, the numbers are projected to rise to about 60 to 65,000 over the next 10 years. And this will lead to a significant burden in imaging and on our pathology colleagues. If we then, at the end of the two decades, or maybe even after one decade, brought in screening for prostate cancer, however that was delivered, then you can start to see a significant rise in the numbers. And once I change the y-axis numbers, you'll see that this is going to be a significant healthcare rise in burden, both on ourselves, our radiology colleagues, and our pathology colleagues. And if we start doing that for renal cancer as well, and this is an early feasibility study looking at whether carrying out an abdominal CT at the same time as a lung health check with low dose lung CT within the Yorkshire uh, lung 
health check study. This is led by Grant Stewart and will start next year. If this starts to show cost effectiveness and the detection of significant renal tumors, uh, which are managed appropriately and safely, then we could at the end of the two decades start to see screening for renal tumors and possibly the abdominal CT will start to find other cancers like pancreas or bladder, uh, which are relevant for us. And so this is what would happen if we started to screen for renal tumors. Again, a significant rise in number of new cases. In, these are incidental omas that we would normally maybe not wish to find. And a lot of these cases, maybe a third, we would want to biopsy. So the biopsy burden will go up. The histological burden will also go up. So we need solutions to that. And that's because with such rising incidents in cancers, we are coupled with a shortage of expert radiologists, a shortage of pathologists, and imaging and histopathology are labor intensive, subjective. They can lead to diagnostic errors and inappropriate treatments. So will there be a role for AI tools? I think so. Um, I think at each of these nodes in the diagnostic process, from right from screening in the community through to a final diagnosis, we're going to have to use imaging and pathology AI tools to triage negative cases away from our pathway, away from our pathologists and our radiologists, so that they don't even have to look at those cases. And for that, we do need high sensitivity and high negative predictive value. And the early data is looking really good. Looking at images or slides is a bit like predicting the weather. It's pattern recognition. No one remembers the huge numbers of times you get it right, but everyone does remember the big misses. A lot of you will remember in 1987, a great storm hit the UK. The day before, the weathermen all predicted the storm would pass us by. Michael Fish made one particularly memorable forecast which stayed with him for the rest of his life. And we might learn some lessons from this. Please have a listen. Uh, here in the UK, that have to happen over tropical waters, but the one in 87 still produced hurricane strength winds. So you don't have to have a hurricane to make hurricane force winds. Nineteen eighty-seven became a turning point. These days, computers can crunch two hundred billion sets of observations a day. Results are sent to the BBC forecasters, like Tom, to translate into an accurate forecast. I think you would be able to predict a storm like the 87 one these days. You would see it on a satellite image. There's something called the sting jet, which is a very clear marker. Uh, you can see from space a particular cloud feature. They're only very short-lived. They're more understood now. And I think back in 87, even if you saw it on the satellite image, you wouldn't know what it was because it was poorly understood. And even when I was at university, the sting jet wasn't even that well known. Was there a sting in the tail on those early satellite images? Mm -hmm. Look at that, it's always, yeah. I mean, that's what they call the sting jet there. It's very, very powerful, all level wings. This is three o'clock in the morning. I think the storm was at its peak. It was. Yeah. And if we go back and look at Bill's forecast. Now, the satellite picture of the the scene, it shows the British Isles and Texas underneath there somewhere. There's the sting jet, staring us in the face. So radiomics, machine learning, artificial intelligence will start to look for features that at the present time we don't see with our naked eye. And there are already a number of AI or machine learning or deep learning tools within bladder, renal and prostate diagnostics. 
And as you can see from the graph, the market is considerably large. At the moment, dominated by breast, lung, cardiovascular, neurological illnesses, but prostate, renal, bladder, testicular will start to get attention from the market. And these are the number of companies now in this space. And the area is really dependent on feature extraction, feature selection, which is then placed together uh, using black boxes to you and I to then develop a tool that should be precise enough to either detect or rule out or both uh, cancers or other pathological entities. And AI tools in imaging and histology should be able to reduce time spent on a case. It should be able to triage cancer cases and focus on areas of interest and streamline reporting. The radiologists and pathologists with an AI tool together might improve the accuracy. So we actually find more cancers without increasing the proportion of false positives. CT-based AI tools for renal tumors, for instance, have been reported showing areas under the curve which reflect accuracy overall in the region of 85 to 95%. And this will start to get better as more of the advanced artificial intelligence tools start to be applied. AI tools for prostate MRI are now getting a significant amount of attention. This is uh, a study by the Bethesda group in the NIH in US, but there are many other groups looking at this, uh, both Imperial, Cambridge, UCL, as well as uh, many mainland European centers as well. And they were able to show user by user a comparison of what the user achieved in terms of sensitivity and what the AI tool achieved in sensitivity. And as you can see, they reflect each other very, very closely. So an AI tool might be as good as an average or better than average radiologist. This is a biopsy specimen of a prostate biopsy, which was diagnosed as benign by a pathologist, but an AI tool called IBEX developed in Israel has shown cancer. This is the first clinical application of an AI tool in pathology, which found cancer that the pathologist missed. And AI tools for prostate histology are showing accuracy of well in excess of 95%. And these tools need further validation. So what about minimally invasive therapies and surgical augmentation? There is a changing landscape of surgical intervention. This is the American take from Atul Gawanda who said that if the past century, past quarter century has brought minimally invasive procedures, the next may bring the elimination of invasion. I'm not so sure about that, but I think there's certainly some credence to that. And this is a rather prescient um, quote from John Blandy, who said that interventional radiologists and surgeons who practice minimum invasion will do most non-emergency surgery. And we're starting to see that already. Open operations will remain only for trauma and reconstruction. And we're going to probably have to have a cadre of those specifically trained with our colorectal surgeons and our gynecological surgeons uh, together so that we develop uh, and maintain the skills. And that means surgeons will need to be trained as microendoscopists and bioengineers rather than butchers and carpenters. Those of you who are Star Trek fans will remember this clip when um, Captain Kirk and Bones, the doctor, went back to the 80s and uh, into the hospital to rescue one of their colleagues. And I think this is also rather prescient, but uh, quite amusing about how our field may be perceived 
well into the future. We'll try down here and check there. What's the matter with you? Kidney dialysis. Dialysis? My God, what is this, the dark ages? Here, can you swallow that? And if you have any problems, just call me. Here we go. No. It's being held in the security corridor. One flight up. His condition is critical. Uh, excuse me. We'll take that. Oh, oh. My door. My door. Was there? I heard the whole thing. Weintraub says radical chemotherapy. She's going to croak just like that. Well, what about Gandhi? We talked about this image there. <laughs> oh, they're going to punch each other out. <laughs> Unbelievable. Do you have a different view, Doctor? Sounds like the goddamn Spanish Inquisition. That day. Sorry, Doctor. Strict orders. Damn it, do you want an acute case on your hands? This woman has immediate postprandial. Out of the way. Get out. Who are you? Why aren't you masked? Who are these people? I don't know. What the hell is that? What are you doing? Ring of the middle meningeal artery. What's your degree in? Dentistry? How do you explain slow impulse, low respiratory rate, and coma? Fundoscopic examination. Fundoscopic examination is unrevealing in these cases. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. My God, man. Drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. I'm going to leave this. So, some of the innovations that we might see may be somewhat far-fetched, uh, and certainly these advances on Star Trek are going to be in the distant future. But I think people in the future will look back on some of what we do uh, with some trepidation and um, disappointment. I think those of you who know me, we have spent the last decade investigating focal therapy. Uh, in prostate cancer, minimally invasive treatment. For those men who have one tumor that might be targeted, the side effects are much lower when you apply treatment to that area alone. And the change we're seeing is similar to the change that breast cancer saw from mastectomy to lumpectomy. And the resistance to change is just as uh, strong, just as vicious, I was about to say. Um, but I think the data is now starting to become really strong. So this is a propensity score weighted matched analysis by Matt Winkler of focal therapy compared to radical prostatectomy. And over a five to 10 year period, the failure rates in terms of transition to salvage local systemic therapy are very similar and the rates of metastases and mortality for those who were concerned that focal therapy would risk men not surviving as long as surgery or radiotherapy also is very, very acceptable and encouraging. So I think we're going to see change over the next five to 10 years in prostate cancer and significant change. What about technology to help us when we do surgery? So these are microparticles, ceramic, highly porous, that you can impregnate with cytotoxic drugs, such as docetaxel, carbacitaxel, um, and they can be applied to any surface after surgery, for instance, after radical prostatectomy, after partial nephrectomy, 
and they can release their payload over a number of days through this highly porous material. And that might help reduce local recurrence rates. The days of wanting molecularly targeted cytotoxic drug delivery, I think have held us back. There are other ways of delivering cytotoxic drugs uh, to tumors without applying it intravenously and without looking for that magic bullet of molecular targeting. And these can be done by either direct injection or by applying magnetic fields which deliver those payloads to the correct area. And there are a number of companies now investigating this. This is going to start to come into the urological area. So magnetic targeting, for instance, are where the payload is loaded with magnetic particles and then using a normal scanner, you can actually guide those particles to a anatomic space within the body and then release that payload through an external stimulus, which might be a magnetic uh, pulse or a light pulse or something else. We're going to start to see miniaturized robotics and microendoscopy. This is a tool that's already being um, used in trials for gastric endoscopic resection of tumors, submucosal resections. And I think we're going to start to see more of this within urologic practice. So this is a tool in early development, which is looking at um, miniaturized on block resection of bladder tumors. I think we're going to see research to improve surgeons. So, as well as simulation and huge and promising work from Procar Dasgupta's work in Kings with Cameron Ahmed, but this is much more proactive. So, um, transcranial direct current stimulation from this recent study by Daniel Leff at Imperial, who's a breast surgeon, shows that basic surgical skills on average can be improved compared to sham. More studies need to be done on complex surgery, but this looks very interesting. We still don't know how it works though. And then finally, with all of these innovations, and I've only touched the surface of them, how do we get the evidence? How do we prevent either adoption of something that doesn't work or is harmful or doesn't particularly improve on outcomes versus the need for patients and ourselves to deliver treatments that might and will improve outcomes or reduce cost or reduce time or improve recovery. So we need to innovate. And that's because we're pretty bad at doing surgical comparative research because we think we know best. And sometimes often patients want a choice, especially if we give them those choices. And this has been recognized for a long time now. And I think the culture is getting better. Um, but we still, I don't think, have an embedded culture in urology of taking on prospective research and delivering comparative studies because there's a cultural resistance to randomization. There's an issue with blinding. The learning curve is a big issue. You spent years learning a new technique and so your equipoise is generally affected. Preference-based randomizations, such as this study uh, mirroring what happens in a study called PACE, where you look at whether there is strong preference for one or other treatments and you deliver randomization based on that. The cohort multiple RCT is another design which is being used by Maxine Tran in renal tumors, by the King group for bladder cancer and for prostate cancer at Imperial. And this is where you recruit a large cohort of men with the disease of interest and you identify 
those that might be suitable for a particular intervention. And you invite half of them randomly to have that intervention and you compare the ones who were eligible but not invited to those who were eligible and invited and accepted the intervention. And you can carry on doing that because if you have a large enough cohort, you can deliver intervention B and compare it to control B. You can deliver intervention C and compare it to intervention C, uh, control C. And you can carry on doing this. And so we'll see whether this trial design works and whether it delivers the benefits that we think it will. Stepped wedge randomized control trials may be another solution that we use in surgical uh, trials. This is where each center is randomized to then deliver an intervention in time. So center one starts off for a few months, delivering the intervention goes back to control. Center two, then center three, delivering the intervention and then going back to control and because that initial randomization has occurred, you can then compare control to intervention. And you can build in time windows for learning curves. You can build in a pause in between intervention and control so that the system resets. And I think this is something we're going to have to increasingly look at within urologic cancers. And as a result, you can have a strategy where you deliver a trial for every patient at every stage. This is what we did in North London, firstly at UCL and now at Imperial, where we look at the entire pathway and try and create innovative trials that we want to see um, that will be of interest for patients and we recruit hard and recruit fast to get those studies delivered and answer the key questions over the next 10 to 20 years. And so my vision, our vision should be within the British Urologic Oncology community, particularly as urologists, we should be leading this strategy. And so a trial for every patient at every stage for every urologic cancer. So I think the future is very rosy. I think we're going to see a lot of innovation. We're going to lead those innovations as urologic surgeons, and we're going to deliver those trials. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity. Many thanks.